This is an oral history interview with Lester Melnick on uh, Tuesday, October 25th, 2011, conducted by May Siebel. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview, Lester. Uh, first, I'd like to know about your family, your parents, uh, where you were from, their backgrounds, all those kinds of Well, I'll facts. be brief. My, my, my dad immigrated from uh, Belarus. He got to the east, to, came through Ellis Island about 1916. And, the, and that was right prior to World War II, World War I, excuse me. And um, what, what the government at that time, they were taking these young immigrant boys and just putting them right in the service. So my father was back in Europe uh, two years later when America went in the World War, World War I. My mother emigrated from, uh, she claims Austria. But I believe it was southern Poland. I guess it's much more elegant to be from Austria than Poland. I don't know. But I think it's the part of the world that was once once Austria and once Poland. And so she's from southern, southern uh, from Austria. And and her family, well, I know that her, her father came to America 100 years ago because we had a family reunion in New Jersey last year. One of my, one of my second cousin's sons, Put the family together, and we all, we all. So I know, I know about, I know when he got here, and so my mother came two years later because the, the the pattern in those years was as it is today with the immigrants that come to this country today. The father and the number one son come, and they work and send money to the old country. My mother <coughs> tells me uh, her recollections of coming across. They left from uh, Bremen, Germany, and uh, and I don't know what year, but maybe 1913, 14, 15. And um, she says she does remember her mother and her sick her mother gathering her six siblings around her in this transport ship to keep the guys from hitting on her mother. Her mother used her kids as a defense against these other men because she was traveling alone with her young children. Uh, but my mother uh, had a business school education in this country, and she spoke uh, English fluently, spoke well. My father had that, that uh, Russian accent, which really I, I found embarrassing as a kid. Now when I hear those wonderful people speaking in, from Israel, and they have an accent that sounds like my father. It just sounds like beautiful music to me. And I really miss him, and I miss that, and I really didn't have a sufficient appreciation for who they were and what they went through when I was when I was a child. If I would complain about something to my father, and he would say to me, you know, what are you complaining about? When I got here, I couldn't even speak the language, so don't complain. But like if Joe DiMaggio struck out a couple times that day, it would really make me very sad. Well, he never understood that. But basically, they were very, very hardworking people. My father was, a, his whole education was in the Hebrew schools in Belarus. He had no education in this country. He would rather read uh, the Forbids, that was a week old, than read today's paper in English. He just loved reading paper in Yiddish. They spoke Yiddish in the home when they wanted to keep secrets from the kids, which I guess is pretty common in those years. But we were very proud to be Americans. We were proud to be Yankees. And uh, we, we, they were very, very interested in our getting an education and our being Americans, which I, which I find a little, little different attitude from a, a lot of the uh, immigrants that come in this country today, which I find very sad. My father started a small business. Actually, I really don't know the facts on this, but he was in, in the liquor, the, the bar supplies business during the prohibition when liquor was illegal. And he was selling the makings, the malt, the hops, the rock candy, brown sugar, glassware, napkins, things of that nature. I think he might have even known some of those guys that were selling booze, but I'm not sure. At any rate, once the law was changed and uh, they repealed prohibition, he opened a small bar. And he had this bar for a few years, and he said, and he got, uh, with long hour, they start at nine in the morning and they work till two in the morning, and he would, we lived above the store. My, uh, no, that's, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. He had a partner at first, and they opened this bar. Well, after about seven, eight years with this partner, he decided he had enough of people sitting in his bar, and he took his bar license, which was an unusual thing at that time, and decided he wanted to have a packaged liquor store where he sold it and people would buy it and go elsewhere. So that's what he did. He had a small retail business, and he ran it himself. He'd open up 9 in the morning, close at 10 at night. 
12 o'clock, my mother would, we lived upstairs. My mother would ring the bell. He would, he would walk up, she would walk down. His lunch would be, his lunch would be on the table. He would eat his lunch. She'd watch the store for that 20 minutes or half hour. Then at six o'clock, she would ring the bell. He would go up, she would come down. And that was what he did. And that, and, and, and he was a hard working, honest guy and, uh, and a good guy. I, I realize now what a good guy he was. And um, uh, when, when he passed away, my mother eventually moved here uh, in, her, in her last four or five years, but he never had very much money, but she never asked me for a thing. I did for her, but she, he, left her, she, she, he left her with enough money to do all the things that she needed to do for the rest of her life. And basically, uh, that was it. I mean, I think that my father thought that I was too much of a... Uh, playing on my mind too much. I wanted to go out and play ball. He thought I was wasting my time. I wanted to go buy a new shirt. He thought I should save my money. And so I had, I had that, we had that sort of a conflict as kids because they weren't very, very modern people. And they were, you know, essentially very conservative immigrant people. They had very little. Uh, my mother did have an uh, education. Did I, did I repeat that earlier? She was a, uh, had a business school education and she spoke beautifully and wrote beautifully. My father, didn't do either of those two things, but he was a good guy. Did your mother work outside the home? No, oh no, not at all. No, she was to, uh, just a uh, homemade. Listen, in those years, you know, if a woman had to go to work, it was kind of a shameful thing for a man that he couldn't make enough money to support his family. That was the mentality. Okay. And how about brothers and sisters? Well, I, I was a middle son. I have a younger sister. I had an older brother, a younger brother, and my sister, Sissy Winters, who lived here in Dallas for many years, she came down, and then she came down with her husband, Alan, and they got a divorce, but she loved it here. He never, he never really liked Dallas. He was a strictly a uh, New York mm -hmm. guy. But she loved Dallas, and she had a wonderful, wonderful circle of friends, and she was very, very happy here. But she was my baby sister. They're all gone now. But my mother uh, lived into her 90s. I'll be 86 next week. And I guess, fortunately, I have my mother's genes, but my brothers, all my father, they all passed away in their, in their uh, 60s, uh -huh. you know. And my sister has been gone now about seven, eight years, and she was uh, 1937, so she was, she was in her 70s. Mm -hmm. she died. What was the neighborhood like? Well, well, it was... Um, you see those, you remember uh, the old Archie Bunker <laughs> TV show? There were, row ha there were row houses. My father, actually he bought this house. What, I don't know what he used for money, I have no idea. But it was a two-story house. We lived upstairs and we had a downstairs neighbor. And um, uh, we were, uh, four of us, um, the, the three of I really don't remember the betting situation. I'm, I'm sure when my, of course, my sister came along quite a bit. Then she's quite a bit young. She was quite a bit younger than I was. She, we were all, but uh, um, I, know, I know we had one bathroom. I remember that. <laughs> I remember my father dominated that in the mornings. And uh, but for what, once, my father started his package store business. He built this building. I don't know where he got that money either. But he built that building, and we had an apartment above it. And. Um, uh, of course, it, it, but shortly, shortly after that happened, that was in early in 1941, 1942, when the war started, I joined the Marines. So I really left. I was 16 years old when I left home. So you're asking me to recall things that are, that, uh, that I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure of the sequence of events, but I know that I know that I was not very happy in that environment. And I knew there was something better than they own New Jersey. Uh, and I found that I always give my credit for finding that out young in my life. And I wasn't, so it wasn't New York, it was New Jersey. They owned New Jersey, and I used to look across the water at the beautiful lights in New York, and I saw all that wonderful thing going across the way, and we, we had really very little. You know, my father let me know also at a very early age, you know, European men know they have to provide a dowry for their daughters. And my father, three sons and one daughter, he told me when I was about 14 years old, he said, son, I am not planning for you. He let me know that straight up. So I went out and I got a paper route and uh, you know and I just did jobs and I made my you know did whatever I could to make a few bucks. And um, then I went off to the service. Uh, 
and I, I, I joined the Marines and I was in the, uh, I signed up for the, for the regulars, so I was in for four years, so I stayed in until after the war was over, but as a result, am I getting ahead of the game? No, go ahead. But as a result of uh, having been in the Marines, I qualified for the GI Bill of Rights, and at that time they paid your college tuition, they paid, bought your books and gave you 50 bucks a month, which was a very lucrative thing at that time. I, f I went to the school at the University of Miami, Florida. I decided for the same money, might as well be in Florida and be in New Jersey. We'll get back to your college experience in a minute, but I'm interested in knowing about your schooling in Bayonne, what the neighborhood was like, your friends, what you got to do for amusement, and kind of what the atmosphere was like well, back then. Like a lot of uh, the small cities back east, the environments were very parochialistic. The, the uh, Italian immigrants lived in their section, the Jews lived in their section, the Poles lived in their As it happened, we lived in, a, in an eclectic section. We had neighbors, as, and we were also colorblind. We absolutely, uh, pe people other colors, uh, we, we just had no knowledge of any prejudices. That. And we, we played ball on the streets with uh, rubber balls and sticks, and we would, we would get a chalk and put a base on the thing, or we might use the fender of a car for first base and the sewer plate for second base. My dad put up a basketball hoop up on the pole out in front of our house and the basketballs that they had for the street, had the, the uh, seams were on the outside because if you're bouncing a ball on the cement, it's gonna, the seams are going to wear. Well, these were balls that were specially designed with thick seams that, are, that are, go out instead of inside so the balls would last and of course they didn't bounce as well but at least they lasted longer. Um, but the kids... <laughs> They were, most of them, they were all first, everybody was, everybody was first generation. I don't think we knew anyone whose parents were born in this country. Everybody was first generation. Everybody was poor. Uh, uh, and actually, my father being in business, we were probably one of the few people on the block that had got an occasional new shirt, new something. Uh, and then, of course, on, on weekends, my mother had six siblings. So that was our Sunday Sunday uh, outings, we would drive, get all of us get in the car. My father had a Packard. It was a two-seater car with a rumble seat. <laughs> and my father and sister and mother would sit in the cab, and my brothers and I, the three of us, would sit in the rumble seat, and off we would go to one of my mother's sister's houses or one of her brother's houses, and we would bring clothes. We would bring the old folks, we'd bring the clothes to the young folks, and and then we would visit, and that was our Sundays. And then, occasionally on a Sunday, we lived in Bayonne, which is across the bay from Newark Airport. And in those days, those big old airplanes with the big two propellers, sometimes we would go on a Sunday to the airport, watch the planes and take off, which was a very novel thing in the 30s. Um, as far as school was concerned, uh, in one case, we lived right across the street from this one grammar school. It's called Woodrow Wilson School on 56th Street in Bayonne. And uh, I remember we had a gymnasium class, and the teacher would play the piano, and we would march around the thing. And then we, uh, our, 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 I believe our education, though, was proud for a public school education. I believe it was pretty good, because in all, in all fairness, uh, I'm just I, I, I think I'm being very objective about this. But you know, Cynthia is from Arkansas, and uh, there are things about her background and education that I think that were, were not what not not really as highly developed as they were mine. So even in those public schools back east in the 30s, I believe that they probably did provide us with a fairly decent uh, education. When I went to Bayonne High School, I don't remember exactly what courses I took, but I do remember after the 11th grade, I felt like these guys can't teach me anything else. Anyway, there was a war going on, and this buddy of mine went over, and we just went over and joined the Marines one day. I'm, I didn't tell my parents, we just went ahead and did it. And about three weeks later, here came this notice, you know. So I told my mother, my father, tried to act as indignant as she was, but I think he was kind of proud of what I did. Uh, but uh, she, uh, 
she really, she really had a very difficult time with that. And it was the first time I'd ever, out of the, out of the state of New Jersey, except going over to, to an occasional ball game to see the New York Giants with my dad. He would take me a couple times in the summer to see the Brooklyn Dodgers or the New York Giants or the New York Yankees. That was the only time I was ever out of the state of New Jersey before I got on the train and went to Paris Island, South Carolina. I went in the Marine Corps. I got in the Marine Corps. They woke me up at 5.30 in the morning and I said, what the heck did I do to myself? I said, God, this was... Anyway, they made Marines out of us after we had a rough, uh, rough two months in boot camp and then we went overseas and then you know, the rest is... We beat them. We came back so home. you were overseas? Oh, I was, in, I was in the Pacific from... I went over in June of 1943 and came back after the war. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, this is interesting. I had two Christmases in 1945 because we crossed the date line. Oh. We were on one side of the date line of December 25th, so it was December 25th. We left we left Sasebo, Japan, somewhere around the 20th or so of December. So I was in Japan from August until uh, December. We came back back to San Diego. But but this is interesting. I was at sea on the way to the Philippines because I think they were getting all the troops rendezvous in the Philippines for an, an invasion of Japan. When, the, when they dropped, we were at sea, and when they dropped the atom bomb in Nagasaki, the second bomb on the 4th or 5th of August, we were at sea and we went right up into Japan. The Japanese hadn't surrendered, but they had quit fighting. So we were the first troops in there on August, like maybe two days or three days after that bomb got. Fortunately, the bomb was like 75 miles from where we were because no one knew, we didn't know a whole lot about radiation in those days. So I, we really, I was kind of in, in the fringes of harm's way all through those years, but never directly. I was in a couple of air raids and, and, in, and this thing like that, but never, nobody, I didn't shoot at anybody and no one had shot at me, fortunately. <laughs> So when you came back, you were, had the GI Bill that sent yes. you to college, yes. and you went to the University of Miami. University of Miami, and, uh, and and when I was there the first time, I met some wealthy guys, and I realized that there was a whole world out there that I was unfamiliar with. A couple of my roommates were from were wealthy boys from one guy was from Chicago, one was from Philadelphia, and I started moving in that circle, and I really kind of liked the way I felt when I was with those guys, you know, and I had a job. So I could supplement, I supplemented my $50 mm -hmm. thing. I also, uh, I was the milkman. I was the only guy in the University of Miami allowed in the women's barracks because I was delivering milk. So that was, that was a plus. But I remember one morning we were at the Copa Cabana on Miami Beach, Copa City, Copa Cabana, I guess it was called then. Jerry Lewis. Dean Martin was just starting a business. We were at that show at the Copa Cabana in 1949, 1950. And uh, I looked at my watch. I said, it's 2, two o'clock in the morning. I've got to leave because I've got to go to work. I had to go and deliver my milk. So I left the party early before they were still partying. And I had to go back to work because I had to be over there to get my milk and make my delivery. Then I had a job with a guy who was, uh, you know, the banners that they put on pole, telephone poles during the state fair and during the World Series now. Well, that was his, he had that contract for the university, for, not the university, for the city of Miami, and we'd go all up and down Biscayne Boulevard climbing up those poles. I get 75 cents an hour climbing up those poles and hanging those uh, banners on those poles. So I supplemented my $50 a month because my father was not going to send me any money because he knew I was down there to play. He knew that, and he was partially right. <laughs> My mother, on the other hand, if she could, you know, save $10 out of her grocery money, she would send me 10 bucks every once in a while. She, you know. What did you major in? Uh, I, I majored in accounting. I have a, I have a uh, you know, just a, a BBA mm -hmm. in accounting. And actually, I'm not sure I got a very good college education. At the time, the universities were really an extension of high schools. I think that the, 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 the staff, the professorial staff, was probably just all patched together. The students ranged in age everything from 17 to 47 because there were a lot of guys coming back from the service. So there were a bunch of kids there, a bunch of old guys there. And, it was, uh, and the campus was, uh, was very small. I, I was back there last year because my grandson is currently at the University of Miami. And I didn't see one thing, not one thing that I recognized. Yes. Nothing at all. 
What uh, Jewish affiliations did you have in your childhood? Did your parents belong to a synagogue? Oh, very much so. Yeah. My father we grew up in an orthodox environment, a very orthodox environment. My father, his greatest pride was to walk to shul on Shabbos with his three sons. We lived seven blocks from the, and a little teeny synagogue where the women walked upstairs and, you know, and it was wooden benches. And on, on the holidays, my father would sit on the end of the aisle and he wouldn't let us out. <laughs> and we sat there. And you know, these old Orthodox Jews, on, on Yontif, they didn't brush their teeth, they didn't shave, they didn't you know, and, uh, and there was no air conditioning, and it was an you know, a, a Indian summer in New Jersey, and a lot of times it wasn't terribly pleasant. But uh, we sat there, and my father loved it. Uh, when I he hear some of the prayers today, of course the services at the, uh, at the Temple Emmanuel are significantly different than what I experienced as a child, but when, when I hear some of those uh, uh, prayers today, and I remember hearing my father just singing out those prayers, it really, it just gives me such a great sensitivity toward, toward my heritage that I really didn't realize when I, at the time I was experiencing it. So I, I think I, I, I'm a lot, a lot more Jewish than I realized I was when, when I left there. Did you go to Hebrew school? Oh yeah, went to mm -hmm. Hebrew school. And I have another interesting thing about that. You know, my mother, family being from the southern Europe, and my father being from, from the Russian area, I was getting instructions from my mother's father. And their dialects were different than these old Russian guys. And the, so every time I would say one word and he would, and I mispronounced it, he wouldn't tell me why he was whacking me on the rear, but I would bend over and whack until, until I figured out what it, but that's the way they taught you. And it was, it was terribly unattractive. And I really couldn't wait to get out of there. And I remember the first morning after my bar mitzvah, my grandfather was over at our house, and he was very, very disappointed that I didn't get up with him in the morning in Davin. I, 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 I decided once I got out through, through Hebrew school, that was it for me for a while. And I remember him being there, and I remember his disappointment. And I didn't care at the time. I care now. I didn't care at the time. But I disappointed him that I wouldn't get up in Davin with him on the Sunday morning. And he, uh, let me tell you about that guy. He needed a cane as he got older. And these are one of the things that I really, really disapprove of and dislike about the Jewish religion. His rabbi would not let him use that cane to walk to the shul on Saturday. And it broke his heart. As an old man, he could not go and pray in the shul on Saturday because the rabbi wouldn't let him use his cane. And th things like that, there are several other things that, that I found very unattractive and I really, Got away. Uh, you know, I, I realize now that there are reasons for things that I'm much more sensitive about them now. But at the time, I really, I really was kind of, kind of negative about all of that. You know, felt it was old-fashioned. I felt it wasn't really, no, not too much room for that in modern-day America. Matter of fact, I'm surprised today when I see these young kids that are Orthodox Jews. I think our society and our environment is not very well designed for them to do it. So I really admire the fact that they're making the sacrifices and doing the things that they're doing, you know, to be Orthodox Jews in modern day America. Tough. So after you graduated from University of Miami and what next? Well, you go? I got back to uh, Bayonne, New Jersey. <clears throat> My father being a big shot liquor retail, incidentally, he did every year what we would do every week over here in Preston Royal. That's the kind of business, very small business, but he did it all himself. And if I was running my own little store myself, I might still have a store, <laughs> you know. At any rate, um, so he got me a job with one of his suppliers, selling booze. So I went around, and I'd go to all of these little bars in Jersey City, New Jersey, in Hoboken, New Jersey, on the waterfront. It was the awfulest thing. And I'd go, and one, this one bar would buy three bottles for, at $4 a bottle, and this guy, and I was a commissioned salesman. And I went around, bet, Bayonne, Jersey City, Hoboken, West New York, North Bergen, all the way up and down the coast of New Jersey. I had customers, and, and, I, and that was, so I did that for a couple of years, but I'd had enough. Then one of my roommates from college, father, was a coat manufacturer in New York, and the rest is history. <laughs> so I got a job at working in a showroom on 37th Street in Manhattan. 
and that, that was my introduction in the apparel business. Uh, this guy, his father died, and he all of a sudden became very rich, and he couldn't handle the money, the wealth. He couldn't handle it. He went a little. At any rate, that business went busted after a couple of years that he ran it, my friend. <laughs> and uh, But there was another man that wanted to sell his coats in Texas. And I didn't know enough to know that the kind of merchandise he had was not appropriate for Texas. But I said I would go down and do that. So I got here significantly on April Fool's Day <laughs> in 1953, April the 1st of 1953. I landed at the old, and I stayed at the old Circle Motel. And Harry Hines, it was a, you might, well, that, it, it was, it was, it was what, it wasn't what it is today, but it was really legit. <laughs> I remember spending the first night out there. And um, I had a little Plymouth convertible, which was inappropriate for this hot Texas summer. And I had these coats that were that thick, plus they had these inner linings. And I went out to sell my coats. Well, I met the nicest people, the night merchants in this thing. Many people were really kind to me, and I never had experienced this kind of kindness back east. And they, they did give me orders, but one guy said, please come home and have dinner with us tonight. One fellow would say, here, give me a set of your color swatches, so if I do get an order, I can buy a coat from you. People were so kind to me, but they didn't give me any orders. And that was April, and in June, my boss came to Dallas and took the line back and fired me. And it never occurred to him to give me 50 bucks for gas back to New York. I was here. And at that time, there was a wonderful man in this town who was very, very popular. And I think most people probably recognize the name of Harold Kallenberg. Harold was a very successful salesman at the time. And he invited on Sunday afternoons all of the guys like me who were here, you know, schleppers, who were trying to get along. He would invite everybody who was home for a buffet. And we all, and he just treated everybody. And, you know, just everybody had a lovely social afternoon. And one of the men I met there said, why don't you go down and even Marcus? He said, my wife works there and they're wonderful people to work for. And so, so I, I didn't know who they were. I, 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 I guess I had heard of Neiman Marcus because uh, in New York, I remember that uh, President Eisenhower's wife had a dress made by Neiman Marcus. I think that's the first time I ever heard of Neiman Marcus when, when President Eisenhower was born. So I went down to Neiman Marcus and they hired me. Uh, 300 bucks, 325 dollars a month. I, got, I was, I was the, on the fourth floor, which is now the gallery. It was then called Younger Set. And I was the floor manager. I'd come off the elevator. How do you do? Get your sales lady. If the stock was messy, I'd hang things up, make sure that the everybody was scheduled properly, and that's what I did. And then, fortunately, I got this real, a real wonderful thing happened. There was a very important meeting at Neiman Marcus, but there was a very important meeting that they had to have a representative in New York in the coat market. Well, they knew that you know I could get off the plane in New York and know where I was going. And they knew I had worked in the coat market. So as a $75 a week guy, they gave me a ticket to New York and represented Neiman Marcus in New York and came back. And then shortly after that, my buyer quit. Was, I don't know, but it was just a matter. In the day when our Sarah was born, uh, I was in the hospital at Cynthia's bedside and I called the store and, and I asked her what was going on and they said that you've just been made the buyer. So you know that thing where they say in our, that with every child comes, and, and that, that was just a series of, a series of events. I mean, I, I, I have been very, very fortunate in that respect. I've just had a series of things happen that just, I just happened to be there when good things happen, you know? I mean, this woman, I had absolutely no experience as a buyer, but having been in New York and having worked with the coats, they, I guess they took a chance, you know? Gave me the buying job. And my salary went all the way up to, uh, I think $500 a month from 350 or something like that. So I was in tall cotton. <laughs> so you became the coat bar? Coat suits. Coat coats suits. and suits. Uh -huh. And then I started doing things and people said, and I didn't realize what, I really didn't realize what I was doing, but I, I, I started doing things that I guess they considered creative, like one time there was a wonderful, uh, 
fur, called, I think it's, it's called a, a Russian, uh, it's a flat fur, I don't know if the name fails me now. But they were selling them in the fur department for like, you know, a couple thousand bucks. Well, there was some guy who had some inexpensive ones that he was selling for $100. So I went, they weren't anywhere near the same quality, but my department was the less expensive department. So I went to, that, to the fur market and I bought those $100 jackets. Then I went to the sportswear market and bought $100 black skirts. And I made suits out of them. I brought them in the Neiman Marcus, the fur guy, went nuts. Stanley Marcus said to him, would you like Lester have it or would you like Sanders to have it? And so, right, well that was Stanley. I mean, Stan, but he recognized that there was a market for all sorts of merchandise. And there were things like that, that, that kept happening. I'm, I'm really, wish, I'm not even prepared to tell all the things. But anyway, that's just one of the things that happened. And there was a series, a series of things like that where they, they started recognizing that I was not just going to go to the market and buy what was available, but that I had some instincts, I guess. For, I mean, I really don't know what makes you like one color and not like another, or realize that something's not going to sell and something's going to be, you know, just happens. I remember, I do remember though, as a child, my mother would put a hat on and say, do you like that? I said, no, I don't like that one, I like that one. So, I mean, that, so that would happen when I was a kid, so I guess that's where that came from. So how long were you at Neyman's? Nine and a half years. And, uh, um, when I, uh, uh, we would come out on a Sunday, you know, Preston Road, you all may remember, was a little narrow macadam road this high with dirt on the sides. And so we would put our kids in the car like I did as a child and drive way out to Royal Lane. <laughs> and I saw this little store there. Uh, it was owned by a name on it was Gloria Klein. Well, her husband, Sam, had been a partner of Lou Lattimore. Before Albert Lindsay bought Lattimore's, Lou Lattimore owned it. And, one, and then uh, these three guys bought it, and one guy was Sam Klein. And there were three partners that owned that, that store. And one was uh, Sam Perlman, Sam Klein, and uh, uh, or someone else. But anyway, Albert bought the store from those guys. But uh, this Sam Perlman came out to Preston Oil, opened up what he called Perlman's Fashion Previews. And uh, he built this beautiful store, and uh, he didn't get his deliveries on his merchandise. He didn't get the store open before he was out of money. So his ex-partner, Sam Klein, who had married this young woman, Gloria Klein, he took it over in bankruptcy. And then Sam Klein died shortly after that. Um, and uh, Gloria Klein, I recognize the name, Gloria Klein. One day this woman comes to Neiman Marcus to buy a coat. Well, you know, they called me in the fitting room because you could go in the fitting rooms of women who were buying coats, you know. So I went in the fitting room and I recognized her name and she said, my little store is for sale. I said, great, I know a guy. Give me the name of your, you know. So I got the name of the attorney was Harry, Harry Friedman, who was the loveliest, loveliest guy. And, um, so I called Harry that night and I told him who a friend was, which was me. And um, he, so he said the price is, I don't know, $15,000. I said, fine, I'll buy it. I didn't have $15,000. But the reason, he was shocked. He said, fine. What happened? The price had been $20,000. Everybody was waiting for it to get lower and lower. I thought $15,000 was a fantastically inexpensive price. It was a beautifully decorated store. So I said, I'll buy it. So, well, there was a, a very wealthy coat manufacturer who I was buying a lot of goods from at Neiman's. And he said to me at one time, this is another thing, he said, you know, a kid like you ought to have his own business. And he said that to me. And why he said that, I don't know. But he said, if you ever need some money, I will uh, send you money. So I called him up that evening and I said, Mr. Henry, I think I've got my deal. And the next morning, airmail special delivered a check for 25,000 bucks. No signature, no nothing. 1962, the guy sent me a check for $25,000. I, I didn't pay the 15,000 because I needed cash to buy merchandise to start my business. And um, um, then, uh, and he couldn't sell me merchandise because he was his goods were confined to Neiman Marcus. But that wasn't his goal, that wasn't his purpose. So I went to New York and I went to his bank and the guy said, um, 
Well, go on, just transfer this uh, note to Dallas and pay me back the money. I said, you don't understand. He said, when are you going to pay me back? I said, well, I'll pay you $500 this month. Well, he was used to borrowing $25,000 and getting $25,000 back two days later. I said, I'll send you $500 this month. And he said, you can't do that. And I knew I had the money. I said, yeah, yes, I can, because I already had the money, and that man had endorsed the note. Anyway, I got back to Dallas. I sent him a dress for his wife. I sent him the 500 bucks, like I said I would. And after about, about six months, and I, we had done some business, I, got, had a, I had a appointment with the Republic National Bank, Mr. Florence Bank, and the guy's name was Walter Brock. Walter took me to lunch. I told him I wanted to transfer this $25,000 note to Dallas. He said to me, looking at your balance sheet, I shouldn't even be buying you this tuna fish sandwich. But he said, I'm going to lend you the money because I think you're an honest guy and I think you're going to pay me back. And that's the way business was done in 1962. That today, that it wouldn't be possible for those things to happen today. So I transferred the note. I got out of the bank in New York and got it here and started establishing credit here. And and we just started, and we started opening stores. <laughs> Every time we opened the store, people would show up and start buying from us right away. Doesn't happen anymore like that, but that's what happened in those years. So you had the Preston Royal store, and then you opened up out in Richardson. Well, <clears throat> well the reason I went to Richardson, they came in, and that was owned by the Hunt Interests, the wealthy people, and that guy parked himself at my doorstep every day before he'd go to work. Uh, he would come to my office and stand outside my office till I would see him because he wanted me to open up out there. Well, that was a time when, rest his soul, we just lost my dear Bud, friend Bud Knight, who passed away this year. Bud was at Neiman's. And I saw, met Bud in New York. And I said, Bud, you want to remain being a little fish in the big pond? You want to come be a big shot? And he said, well, so I figured I, I, Bud would run that store and I'd run this store. And that was really what was in the back of that expansion because I knew that getting Bud in there, we would need more business because Bud would be a bigger expense because at that time there was no expense except me and Cynthia and my Visa card, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that was, and, and, then, and then once we started doing that, we started advertising, then people came to us and they get, made, us, uh, made us attractive offers to expand our business, which, uh, which we did. And most, most of them were okay, some weren't so good, and some we opened some, closed some, and, but we had a business, you know, we were, we were busy. Where did you open and close? I just remember Preston Royal and Richardson. Oh, well, we, you... uh, we had a store in, actually, out where the Cowboy Stadium is, right at that intersection mm -hmm. on Collins and Randall Mill and Collins. We were in that center. I wish I owned that center today, with the Cowboy Center. But we had a store there. We had a store in, uh, you, you know where Colwell's is on Hillcrest? Well, we, uh, there was a, we took a lease in a store adjacent to that. We uh, opened, uh, we had a store in Casa Linda by the old theater. We had a couple of Leslie stores in Plano, one on the east side of the expressway, one on one at Park. Uh, Park. We had one at, uh, by Bachman Lake, which was a disaster. On the north side of Bachman, there was a new shopping center there, and the guy said, I'm gonna build you a store, and all I had to do was put the merchandise in and put a manager in, so you know, so we put a store there, but that, so anytime, anytime, that's another, anytime you get something for nothing, that's about, you know, it's work. Um, what else do we have to do? We had North Park. Really we had several stores in North Park. Yeah. We uh, opened up, what happened, as a matter of fact, is Harry, Harry uh, Friedman, the attorney that I first did business with, who was so kind to me, when, when this small store was going out of business, you remember the, um, Page Boy Maternity, they had that corner store at North Park. Mm -hmm. Well, they were going out of business. And he needed someone to get in there and take that lease or buy the fixtures. And he said that doing, that, was, that doing business was so easy the last time. And he called me right away. And I said, yeah, great. So we got into North Park and we got in at their lease terms. So we had a very, you know, North Park became very, very prohibitively expensive for a small business. But at that time, they probably had an original lease and we got in there at a very inexpensive lease. And that was our entree into North Park. Then we opened up across the way where the Oscar de la Renta store is. Because mm -hmm. uh, then we, Went upstairs when they when they built the second level. We 
we had that corner lease upstairs, and then we had a store upstairs and a store downstairs. We had a Leslie's downstairs and all that. Sort of stuff. So I think there were 12 stores at one time. Something like that. I, 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 I'd, have, I'd have been better prepared if I were no, free to ask me that question. <laughs> uh, were you being so busy with these stores and opening them and all the thing, things that it requires to run a store, were you active in any Jewish organizations here? Tell me about some of your involvement in the community. I'm trying to think of all of it. Well, I was in that uh, the SMU, I was on the board of the SMU lecture series. I was on the board of the Dallas Summer Musicals. I was, um, um, I was, I was, I was a founder of the uh, Reunion Bank, when they, which is now the, the Amogee, it's now mm -hmm. Amogee Bank, but I was one of the original board. Uh, um, um, I, I must confess, I really wasn't terribly active in the Jewish community. You know, Cynthia is not Jewish. Um, uh, what, what we had a very, very, our, our uh, we, we really let our children really decide how they wanted to live their lives and with their social activities. And actually, it was a bit of a problem for our daughters in that uh, if, uh, if, uh, I, I think the the community didn't know if there was some lovely Jewish boy came into the Southwestern Medical and didn't know whether they were telling introducing one of my daughters or not. As it happens now, my daughter Sarah is an uh, officer over at Temple Emanuel, and she's very very involved in the uh, thing. Our other two daughters have chosen to take other other uh, avenues for their religions, but I'll tell you that has never been an issue in our family. We all get together. My uh, Sarah's daughter loves to go to Christmas services at the Methodist Church. L uh, Leslie's daughter comes to Rosh Hashanah services with Clara's daughters. I mean, with, Claire, with Sarah's daughters. So I mean, we have a wonderful, wonderful um, ex experience in our family. It's never been a problem in our family at all. How did you meet Cynthia? How did you all meet? Neiman Marcus. She was uh, Neiman. Mar you might remember this. Through that vintage. Uh, Neiman's had a uh, college board where they would bring girls in from the Southwest Conference schools as, uh, as counselors to the new freshman girls going to that school. So uh, she had been at SMU one year and this one woman who she was a roommate of at SMU, uh, and she was back at the University of Arkansas, Cynthia was. Well this girl knew Cynthia and invited her to come and, and represent the University of Arkansas at the college board. I started Neiman's uh, the weekend of July the 4th. Of 53, Cynthia came in on July the 15th of 1953, and uh, it's an interesting story. But about 10 years later, one of the sales ladies that worked with me at Neiman's was working for me at Preston Royal, and she told me it was a big joke there because they used to see me sneaking back to the model's office in the afternoons, you know. So they were wise to my game. And, and I, was, she, they, I never knew it at the time, but they told me 10 years after the fact. So that was it, and she, she, we, got, we got married the following uh, June in, in Arkansas, which almost heralded my mother and father, but Cynthia has since become their favorite granddaughter, their favorite, uh, had become their favorite uh, daughter-in-law, because she really is. She's what she is. <laughs> uh, tell me about your grandchildren. Well, uh, I'm very proud of my grandchildren. I have uh, uh, three daughters. We have five granddaughters and a grandson, baby Joseph. He's 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 presently a sophomore, a junior at the University of Miami. Joseph is, but Jessica, our first granddaughter, is now in a uh, computer executive in Fort Worth. She graduated from TCU. She's a computer executive. She's very very bright. And, and, and very, very capable computer person. Language, which is just something I'm familiar to me. Our, uh, Leslie's oldest daughter, Meredith, is a Peace Corps volunteer in Albania. And she's actually just taken some of her uh, SATs to, to go back to graduate school when she, when she finishes her, uh, her uh, tour of duty, which will be in the following spring. So I think she's going to go back to graduate school next fall. She's 24. Sarah's daughter, Claire, is uh, with the uh, Interfaith Youth Organization in Chicago. Jacqueline, 
grad just graduated from Northwest uh, from uh, uh, Colorado State, and she's uh, actually in the retail business. She's uh, she's uh, Nordstrom's, but she also has made a connection with a with a, uh, a uh, United States representative, and she's going to work on his uh, re-election campaign starting January for a politician in Chicago. And I really don't know what his politics are or anything about it. But and uh, and Leslie's younger daughter Tracy is a senior at SMU, majoring in advertising. Last summer she was a uh, a uh, volunteer at uh, at, at a. Uh, at advertising agency in Boston, and so she's getting very, you know, getting a lot of experience, and she's uh, interviewed with a couple of places here in uh, Dallas, and I think she apparently is very interested in the advertising business. That's five, and then the sixth one is Joseph, whose father is an architect. You know, Mark builds homes, Mark Albert builds yes. homes in Dallas, and the Joseph, he got Joseph interested in the architect business, and Joseph seems to like it very much and be, and be very successful at it. So he's, uh, and he apparently is. Uh, Prosper at the University of Miami. I think you're right. The president. I get the impression he's more interested in the football team and what the price of Coors beer is. But, but uh, you know, I guess that's part of the university. Um, you've seen a lot of changes in Dallas. Um, you've seen a lot of changes in Dallas since you moved here. I'm particularly interested in knowing in the apparel business what you've seen happen here. This was such a fashion center in the country. I think the third behind New York and Los Angeles and look what's happened to no apparel mart. Very little, no manufacturing, local manufacturing of women's apparel and men's apparel as there used to be. Talk about that a little bit. Well, the, the nature of the business, is, it just changed very radically. Once. When I first went in business, if I wanted to buy merchandise, I'd get on the plane and go to New York and walk in the back room and pick the dresses off the rack and ship them to Dallas. Then the back rooms became North Carolinas, where the fabrics were made. Then the back rooms became Japan, where they, they started importing fabrics from there. Then the back rooms became Bangladesh and Japan. Well, once, once the manufacturing function became so far away from the, from the seasons, then the, the fashions necessarily had to be more classic. In other words, when they produced something and they could deliver it in six weeks or eight weeks, then you could do something that was very, very fashionable. But if you buy something in January, which is going to be delivered to you in June, you really need to be very, very careful about the classic nature of what you buy so that when it gets into your store, it's going to be something that people are going to want to buy and not be out of date because six months when I first went into business was a lifetime. And now it's just a wink. The other thing that was really, what really made our business more difficult is that if, if I bought 10 of this and 10 of this, if I sold these 10, I could get 10 more flown in tomorrow. These 10 are never going to sell, so I have to eat those or mark those to nothing and get rid of those. But if I can capitalize on the good 10, I can overcome the losses on the bad 10. Well, you sell the good 10 in one day and you say, fine, I'd like to buy 10 more. They say, fine, Lester, whatever you want, we'll ship them to you in four months. So, well, I can't use them in four months, I need them in four days. So we, we couldn't, so we couldn't capitalize on our gains and, and we had to take care of our losses. That's what happened to a business like mine. Big businesses tend to dominate their suppliers to a greater extent than we would in a small business. So they could uh, they could uh, promote things, make things happen, but they still would have to buy very far in advance. And uh, and they would and, and and I think that as a result of that, this, in, in response to your question, I think that's probably what happened to this really advanced fashion market that we have. It just uh, it just. It's just not possible for it to, for it to exist with with the markets being so far from the from the where the place that, where the things are consumed. Um, th that's just one one aspect of it. I think the other thing was the the dominance of the of the the uh, businesses with the dollars. There were people that if if I did a lot of business with a vendor and I said you know I've got these couple of things I'm not selling he said I'll swap them out and give them back to you got to be where a guy came and Lester listen let me tell you I really love your business I'd love to do for you but uh, Mr. Nordstrom needs me to s s 
support his, Mr. Neiman Marcus needs me to support him, and I just can't help you anymore. I love your business, I'll do whatever I can for you, but I can't give you any more advertising, I can't help you out with any of this, because I don't have the wherewithal to do that, because these big companies started putting so many demands upon their suppliers. So when they start dominating their suppliers, they tell them what they want, and, and, and the you know, retailers are not essentially not designers, not creators. The creativity and design came from the small design rooms in, in New York, and the creative people who, incidentally, an awful lot of them are gone too because of this terrible epidemic of AIDS, many of them from the gay community. And we lost a whole lot of very, very creative people for, between, the seven, between you know, in the last 25 years. You can go right down the line and mention the names that have been familiar to all of us that just aren't with us any longer. So that's also what happened to you. What about the city of Dallas? Well, just, you know, doing business in Dallas. What, what changes did you see up until the time you decided to close your store? Well, when I first opened, it was very, very personal. People would come in and, and uh, they, they wanted to know me and I wanted to know them and we knew where the weddings and the bar mitzvahs were and who was going off on holidays and we knew all that. Well, a lot of that went away and I didn't realize how much it went away till I opened up a shop in Fort Worth in the uh, middle 90s. And when I got to Fort Worth, I said, God, the atmosphere here, the attitude in Fort Worth is comparable to what it was in Dallas in the 60s. It's still a small city. The people came in. They were happy to have the store there. And we were really personal. I wasn't, obviously wasn't there as much as I was here, but I got there quite often, and I met the people, and it was the same kind of attitude which we had lost here in Dallas. Dallas became, became a big city. And, uh, the, uh, and, then, and then, of course, my sales ladies. Many of them were suffering from being too successful. And I had a very difficult time managing some of them. They started making a lot of money. They got a little independent with some of their clientele. Uh, and they were very selective about who they would wait on. Some I mean, there were things I really had a lot of, a lot of uh, battles in. And then I got to where I said, well, if I ask this lady to leave, I know there's a circle of about 40 customers. There might be, she might have to be serving 100, but there might be about 30 or 40 that are really loyal to her. And I really, you know. so. You know, you met things with mixed emotions, and I, I really wasn't running my business myself anymore. It got to be bigger than, you know. And, and I'll tell you another thing. As far as organization, I don't think I was ever as well organized. I know that we didn't do as well in any branch store as we did at Preston Royal. It just seems wherever the boss is around, everybody acts a little bit better. And we never were, and we were successful. We did well at North Park, and we did well at, uh, but. Never, never, any, any problems we ever had in the business was always overcome by our successes at Preston Royal. Preston Royal paid for everything. So what ultimately determined that you were going to close the store? Well, the last couple of years, we were working very, very hard. We were paying a huge amount of money in taxes, between the Avalorum taxes, between and the, the and our insurance things, our um, health insurance for our, because you know, insurance companies don't like women clients, because a lot of things can go wrong with mature women, <laughs> as you well know. And so my insurance premiums got very high. The, uh, the um, oh, there was a, uh, oh, I forget what it's called now. It had to do with, with, uh, with one of your employees getting hurt on the job. Uh, Workers' comp. Bingo. Workers' comp got to be prohibitively expensive. So between the insurance and workers' comp, the Avalorum tax, each year you pay a tax on the size of your inventory plus what it costs to get your inventory to Dallas. There's no state tax in Dallas, in Texas rather, but we pay a tax on that Avalorum tax. So I said to my daughter Leslie, who was working seven days a week as I was, I said, you know, Leslie, between all these insurance things and these taxes, the government is getting about twice as much out of this company as you and I, and we're working very hard. And we really, we weren't making any progress. Um, and and um, um, I, it, it, was, it was a very difficult thing, because I know when I closed that business, I turned, we had about you know, 75 or 80 employees uh, before we closed up, and about 25 of them were really spectacular. And I know I turned loose about 25 really great employees on this town, so I've done, done 
at least there was something good that <laughs> came, out, came out of our closing up. But it, it just wasn't in the cards. The, uh, we kind of painted ourselves in the corner. We had a whole lot of space at Preston Royal. Uh, the Millers, who had always were very, very kind to me and very good to me as landlords, well, they needed to get much more revenue out of that center. The center it became, and our space, we had a huge amount of space. It would have cost me an awful lot of money to, uh, to remodel the space, and I had to decide, do I, do I, am I, am I? Um, what have you been doing with yourself since you retired? Well, I've, I've been taking my wife to lunch, I've been taking my grandkids to lunch, mm. and I've been playing a lot of golf, and we've been doing a lot of traveling. We never celebrated, we did celebrate Thanksgiving, and we did celebrate Christmas, but never, never like normal people, because Thanksgiving, we always had to get ready for the after Thanksgiving sale, before that, I mean, from, from early November till January 15th was like one long day. And I was never, never really totally, totally at ease because it was always something. I mean, many times I'd run over there on a Christmas morning to, to do something or, or <coughs> take some last minute markdowns I'd forgotten to take or something. Because we just lived, we lived, you know, it was seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We'd go on a holiday, we'd spend half the time looking at stores. Now we go on a holiday and we go on a cruise and we go out like normal human beings. And we've been doing a lot of traveling. We spent a month this year, actually we visited our granddaughter. She came from Albania to Dubrovnik and we spent a week with her in Dubrovnik, which was really great. And we took, we had a cruise before and a cruise after. So that's, the, I mean, that's the kind of things I really feel very privileged that I'm able to do those kind of things, you know. So that's what we did this summer. And next summer I'm going to get the heck out of this town again. <laughs> so I know just if I can. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, this is the fact that I'm very, very flattered by the fact that you wanted me to do this. Um, I, I think that I've really, uh, I've, I've glossed over you know, much of my, uh, much of my history. I, I, I really, I really don't know. I think that for any specific questions, but I think you really got the essence of, of uh, my experience here. I, I would like to add, though, however, being here in a marvelous place like Dallas, Texas, really had been a complete revelation to me. I just never knew places like this existed. And when I got here, the reception that we received and, and the reception that we got all through our years, and even to today, to the reception I've received from two you two wonderful women, it's just, a, it's just a wonderful thing for me. When I look back at my background and, where, and all the wonderful things that's happened to me over the years, just very fortunate. I do would like to add also my affection for Hawaii. When I was in the Marines, I was stationed there for a year, and I met some marvelous people there. Matter of fact, some people who invited me to their home, they had a guest home, which was my residence on the week when I had liberties. They let, why they, this woman called me her war baby. Her kids were off, in, uh, in, in, you know, away from Hawaii, and I, I was there, and, and they took me around and introduced me to this uh, society in Hilo, Hawaii, and as a result of that, Cynthia and I have been back and forth to Hawaii maybe 20 times, and we really, then we did the things, and then we made a business out of it also with those Hawaiian things we did in the store and all those Hawaiian clothes we sold. So the whole thing, it was just a, just a lot of wonderful things have been happening to me all my life and continue to happen to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> this, this has been terrific. Well, I hope so. I hope so.